Hey, True Believers England team here with another episode of Comic Book Origins where we take a look at any comic book superhero, villain, or team, side character, doesn't matter, and in this case we're looking at a place. It's Star Trek Starfleet Academy where recruits go to learn how to be Starfleet officers. The motto from the stars, knowledge, taken all the way from the United States Navy from knowledge, sea power. Dun, da, da, dun, bum. All righty, gang, this is a commissioned video. Thank you very, very much to Chrononaut. And with all that aside, let's get this party started and jump right on into Starfleet Academy number one. And as always, we start off with a cover, and, well, it's one of those, hey, let's attack whatever it is off screen that's bothering us kind of thing. We've even got a Ferengi, it looks like, uh, a Vulcan. And a blue woman who seems to be absolutely... She's failing. I'm sorry. It's obviously some sort of shooting match, and she came unarmed. How can you get into whatever hollow deck this must be if you're walking in unarmed? Lady, it's time for you to go. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. The book opens up on a splash page. We see the title... Prime Directive, and a big old ugly alien. You Starfleet cadets, you all want to see the face of the unknown? Take a good look, cadet. It will be your last. Brought to you by writer Chris Cooper and artist Chris Rinald. And we find out that the cadet is there just to score a drug. And the uh, the Jankth is what the monster's called, but his name is Sths. And uh, he says, okay, he's going to kill the kid. But then one of the henchmen says, dude, if he shows up dead, you're going to have security all over the place. But if he overdoses, nobody's going to question it. And then we find out that the drug that he's actually after is Jankth saliva. So he's shooting spit or something. But as soon as they learn the key ingredient to the drug, Starfleet Academy security d dives in and... Uh, we get a whole bit of, oh, that dude was about to kiss me. And then another guy escapes and he's like, oh, don't worry. I know the sewer systems. And they begin chasing him. So we see the kid tackle, I guess his name was Carson, the bad guy from Starfleet Academy who's been selling the drugs. And he stops the bad guy and we learn his name is Decker. And he's like, dude, you're already uh, well known because of your lineage. And he's like, are you kidding? We just busted this ring single-handedly. We could write our own ticket. We're heroes. But of course, that's not the way things go. It's one of those, hey, you busted up a sting operation we were working on forever and a day. And now I'm going to have to split you two up. And the subject is not open to debate. Dismissed, Cadet Mishima. And as for you, Mr. Deckard, I am assigning you to a mega training squad, and frankly, I'm not sure who to pity you. You or your training supervisor. Commander Zund! And we see Zund come in. You are now mine, Mr. Decker, as are your teammates Camila Goldstein, Pava Eknor, Akaba of Andor, Tapril of Vulcan, and Nog of Fer Ferenganar. Oh, okay, the Ferengi. Alrighty, I am not a Star Trek guy. I mean, I like the TV shows some, but I, I don't follow this all that much. I don't know the names. That's what I'm saying. So we cut to Nog, the first Ferengi we learn in Starfleet Academy. And we also meet Boothby, the groundskeeper, who basically is like, yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, things on Earth take a little bit for a Ferengi to get used to. And when you meet Decker, tell him that I'm pretty much furious at him. And next time I'm going to let the bad guys have him instead of uh, signaling Starfleet security that he needs help. And so we follow Nog home as he's wondering and worrying about what's going to happen. That package from Uncle Quark should have arrived by now. The package that will make me the most sought-after cadet in the Academy. Home at last, and with any luck, the key to profits and popularity is waiting inside for me. Though I shouldn't worry about impressing my teammates. After all, three of the four are only women, and what good is a... And he opens the door. Big smile on his face, thinking, useless female... And we see the Endorian standing there naked. And she introduces herself. I'm Pava Eknor, your teammate. 
And I just wanted to greet you in Ferengi fashion, which requires women to be nude. After all, what harm could it do? This is how Ferengi males see their sisters, their mothers, and Nog says, and their mates. And that's when he gets thrown through the door and she's yelling, you misbegotten son of a carrion worm. This kind of thing actually happened to me once. So the Andorian gets dressed and is not very happy talking about how violent a race the, uh, the Andorians are. You've had the merest taste of violence. You'll taste the passion only if and when I choose. And that's when Decker walks in. Am I interrupting something? The Andorian answers, ha, in his dreams. So he sees the Ferengi Norg on, the, on his butt in the floor and he's saying, uh, why am I not surprised to find you like this? We haven't even met yet, and you've already confirmed my worst fears about a Ferengi in Starfleet. You must be Deckard, and you must be out of your mind. I won't tolerate inappropriate conduct towards a fellow cadet, and neither will the Academy. I suggest you either work on your behavior or a transfer off this cam campus. And next up, we meet two more cadets. One is a human, uh, half Jewish, half Muslim, uh, who fights the Six-Day War, she says over and over her name's Camila, and she does it so that it... Uh, fuck a donkey. And so we meet two more of the cadets uh, on a holodeck battle where they're fighting the Six-Day War, which was between the Jews and the Muslims. Her name is Camila Goldstein, half Jew, half Muslim, and she fights the fight to remind herself that once upon a time, her mother and father's people were bitter enemies, and that is what Starfleet is all about. It's about bringing sentient races together peacefully. And we also meet the Vulcan. The next morning, they're sitting through some sort of lecture about diplomacy and your first contact and all that kind of thing. And we learn that the book is really about racism as uh, some guy bumps into the frange and then insults him. It's... Seriously, we really have no idea who these people are. We're 13 pages in. It's time to get to know the characters other than that's the Ferengi, that's the Andorian. Let's go, guys. Because otherwise, everybody's acting exactly alike except for those two characters. Anyway, we do see that, well, Ferengi aren't exactly welcome as a guy bumps into the Ferengi guy. I, I, what's his name again? Gorn Norg? Norg. And he's like, oh my gosh, he did that on purpose. It's the little things that can annoy you. Don't you agree, Ferengi? Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Are you too short to watch where you're going, you little toad? And we see Decker jump in. Are you too stupid to know when you're out of line, you oaf? Hey, you better figure out whose side you're on, Decker. And I love this exchange. Because Decker looks him right in the eyes and says... I'm not on the side of juvenile bullies. Oh, I'm sorry. I used a word with more than two syllables. Do you need a universal translator? This gets the guy mad, and he's like, you uppity little. And Norg says, looking very grateful that Decker has helped him out. That was great, Matt. Thanks. I knew you'd come around. Look, Ferengi, use those ears for once and get this straight. We're not friends, and we never will be, so just stay from, stay away from me until 800 hours when our squad's training session begins on Holodeck 7. If you're still in the Academy by then, it's, I, I love this because he's like, I don't like bullies unless I'm doing the bullying. and Because he immediately insults the one guy, insults the Ferengi. I'm digging this book. It is a contradiction left and right. I have to say, while I'm not appreciating the execution, there are some good ideas here. This we have, an, it's basically an officer school, and they are studying ways to handle first contact. I think that's a brilliant idea. And so that's what's happening here. They're going to get one uh, where they basically know what to do during a situation and one where they absolutely don't. And they put... Uh, the uh, half-Jewish, half-Muslim girl in charge. So the students are on the holodeck. They find themselves in a position where they are on a planet who you're supposed to approach people diagonally, but all of a sudden there's a random thunderstorm, or at least they're told to hit the ground because it's a random thunderstorm, and that has the Ferengi going, random and then everybody looks over at Norg saying hey dude do you know something we don't know 
And then another group comes up and they kind of look like snarks from the old uh, Power Pack cartoon or comic book. And they're, no, it's the Gorns. But they're a real species and potentially deadly, says Deckard. I actually do know what the Gorns are. Um, I, I kind of dig that episode. It just proves what a wonderful actor William Shatner is. That, so, yeah, I kind of stumbled there. Excuse me for a moment. And while the kids are in the holodeck wondering, you know, what's going on, why the situation has changed, we see outside that there's all sorts of higgledy-piggledy. What the devil's going on there? Computer, delete all program anomalies, restore safeties, open the blast doors. And they're trying to get in to help the students, so we automatically know this was not supposed to be happening. We see Deckard saying, at least we know what to do about the Gorn first encounter. And, uh... The leader there, uh, I forget her name. Anyway, she st uh, drops down. Hail to you, esteemed Gorns. We make no claim on land, sea, or air. And then the Gorns say, You have placated the Gorn, but as of this moment, we are no longer Gorn. We are now hy hypothetical race Gorn 4.0. Your methods have offended the Gorn 4.0, and you now must die. It doesn't take long for the students to figure out that everything is real. As a matter of fact, the Norn pushes Camilla, that's the leader's name, and she's like, hey, my antenna are sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. That disruptor blast was real and set to kill. And they noticed their own phasers hadn't popped into the holodeck. So they decide to take the Norn so they could retreat and regroup. But when they do retreat, they talk to each other. They find out that the Ferengi had added in, as he says, uh, I figured I could heighten the realism, I could market the expander to cadets, which is supposed to make things seem realistic, earn vast income just to cover my expenses and become wildly popular, but I deleted it. And that's when they realize that the computer has become aware and alive, and the Ferengi says that they're actually, they should be negotiating with the computer and not the Norn. And at first they're trying to figure out how they could talk to their teacher in order to shut down the computer but they realize wait a second this is now a sentient life form and this is really a first contact situation so they discover that if they use morse code maybe they can talk to the computer and get them to or get it to shut off all of the dangerous situations and so the some students try to stop the computer physically with what looks like phasers that shouldn't have, i guess they're, they're the norn phasers while it looks like the Ferengi is tapping something on Decker's finger and then everything just shuts off, the computer says sorry and disappears. Like just tapping something on your finger, you no digital, nothing like that. It's just tip, tip, a tip, 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 and he's gone. Come on, seriously. Anyway, the next day we see the Ferengi approach Decker and he's like, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I did all that and I, I, I'm going to quit the Federation, whatever. And Decker's like, dude, we'll never be friends, but we couldn't have survived it without you, which, come on. He created the problem. He literally is the problem. But they say, well, it's not everybody who could say they created their own life for him. They shake hands and... We see the old groundskeeper talking to the teacher. He's like, this is the most volatile mix you had since the 84s. And remember what happened there? And the teacher's all, yeah, well, we need a new breed of student for, for all the dangers that is really out there. And okie dokie. I guess that's where we stand right now. And then we get the little coda, the advertisement for next issue. We see Kamala walking by the Vulcan's uh, room. Her name's, I guess, Tapala? Tapia? I can't pronounce these names. And she hears crying, but she's like, I must be crazy. Vulcans keep their emotions totally suppressed. A Vulcan would never cry. But we see her. She's staring in the mirror, and she's going, Go away, you're not real, is, oh, we got a little Romulan going on. And she says, yes. Forget you ever saw me, Tapriel. Forget your own true face until the time is right. Forget that you're a Romulan spy. Forget. So there you go. When this was commissioned as the comic book origin of uh, Starfleet Academy, I was like, are, are, this is the first time that Starfleet I don't, I don't know. But anyway, this is the issue that was requested. So, um... I thought it was, I don't know, uh, like I said, I think the ideas were better 
than the actual execution of the comic book. Um, I do like the the idea of seeing people learn. I always loved the New Mutants whenever they focused on the fact that the New Mutants are supposed to be students rather than just a smaller or younger version of the X-Men. And so I kind of dig this thing. Like it, it sort of creates the people who are going to be on the starship. And it's really cool to find out, you know, why did Uhura decide to be communications? You know, why is uh, Chekhov where he is? And I think that that kind of thing is really cool. Unfortunately, well, I, you know what? I'm not going to say unfortunately. I'm going to say, you know what? It really does also pay attention to kind of the feel of the original Star Trek and some of the next generation episodes when you're thinking how cheesy they could be so if you look at it that way i think the comic book comes off a little bit better you know while i'm talking i'm actually talking myself into liking it more than i thought i would or i thought i did as i was reading the book so yeah i think it I, it really captures the feel of some of the cheesier episodes of star trek but that's just my opinion what is yours let me know in the comments below and if you like this video click on one of the ones that are popping up right now you might like that as well also, don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell if you haven't done it already. And uh, don't forget to go on over to Patreon or to Ko-Fi. Drop a dollar in the till and help us keep the lights on. Helps keep making videos for you. Like, thank everybody who's already done that. And to everyone, all of the true believers, thank you very, very much for watching.